Hello, my name is Sakura Diesel, and welcome back to Film of the Year. As we continue into the 1890s, we're going to head on over to France to talk about another important invention that also played a role in getting the film industry started. Now, some film historians debate if this device should even be considered a film in the same sense that we think about films today, but doing my research into this topic, I feel this device and the person responsible for it should be covered in this own video, and that's what we're going to do today. So let's talk about the Theatre Opera Key. The Theatre Opera Key was made by French inventor Charles Emile Radon. Born on December 8, 1844, Charles grew up in Moldes Subor, what is now the suburb of Paris. His father was an engineer, and his mother was once a schoolteacher before she met Charles' father when she was 35 and he was 50. Marie, Charles' mother, would give up her job as a teacher to stay home and teach her son all the basic subjects as well as teach him how to think in a scientific manner. But she would also teach her son the fine arts and how to draw, as Marie was also very skillful in watercolor painting. When Charles was old enough, his father Brutus would teach his son about machines and how to work with his hands. Charles' parents would soon be impressed by their son's skills, that they would place their boy in an apprentice position as an industrial designer in Paris where he would repair, assemble, and develop some optical and physical instruments before later learning industrial design for another company to finally working for French photographer and sculptor Antoine Samuel Adam Solomon. Say that three times fast. With the skills Emile had for the time, he would take up photography in 1862, where he would use his photographs to illustrate a dictionary of applied science that would soon be published sometime in 1870. By the time he reached the age of 19, Reynard would further his knowledge and skills where he met Father Epin Mognon. Epin Mognon was a French Catholic priest as well as a physicist. Mignon would hold magic lantern lectures on the most recent scientific discoveries. Those that have attended his lectures would always be amazed by his larger-than-life illustrations based on whatever topic Mognon would hold on that day. Reynard was one of those people that attended Mognon's lectures and he was so impressed that within a few months, Magnon would take Emile on as an assistant, and there's no doubt that he would also convert Charles into Catholicism, due to both of Charles's parents not being religious themselves. After spending and learning as much as he could from Magnon, as well as furthering his education with the help of Brutus' brother, Dr. Claude and Augustus Reynard, Charles Emile would receive his first breakthrough when he started holding Magnon-style Magic Lantern lectures around December of 1873. Reynard would open his lectures to anyone that was willing to learn free of charge. He would give lectures on physics, chemistry, mechanical principles, and fine art. His lectures would be met with positive response, but it would take a few more years for his successful nature to spread on a national level. In 1876, Reynard was reading a French science magazine known as La Nature. In it, there were several articles about the famous optical illusion toys that have been released for a while, such as Joseph Latou's Vesigian scope or William Honer's Zootrope. The latter toy inspired Reynard to create an improved version of the toy. Using a discarded round cookie box, Reynard would make a hand-printed drawing into a set of strips and fold them around the inside of the lid of the box. Then mounted in the center hub of a hollow drum will be a set of mirrors that will reflect off the film strip from the opposite direction. This little change will be an improvement from the slit seen in the Zootrope, as with the mirrors in a more or less stationary position, when rotating the device via by hand crank, the motion would appear to be much brighter and less disordered than the Zootrope. When Renard finished making his prototype, he filed a French patent on August 30th, 1877. He would later call his new invention the Praxinoscope on November 13th of that same year, and he would sell and market his invention sometime in December in 1877 at the Bourmontchet department store in Paris, where it became an immediate success. Between 1877 to 1879, Renard's Praxinoscope would be sold across department stores all over Europe, and with the earnings Charles was receiving, he was able to quit his job as a teacher and devote the rest of his life as a scientific researcher and performer. Around some time in 1879, Reynard would develop the Paractoscope Theater, which was the same device, but it would be hidden inside a box to show only the moving figures with an added theatrical scenery, and he would present a Paractoscope projection device on June 4, 1880. And while his device did well enough, it did present a drawback. With the size of the drum, Emile was only able to draw 12 pictures per slit, and much like any other optical illusion toys before it, people would start to get bored looking at the same animated movements after a while. So Menar had a new task in finding another way to project moving pictures long enough to keep people's interests. According to Charles' son Paul, Menar thought of the plans for his new invention when looking at his bicycle. 
may not have thought up a device where you can advance the film strip the same way you would advance a bicycle using the pedals. With this, Maynard would start sketching his latest creation and began to build the machine around the mid-1880s. He filed a patent on December 1st, 1888, naming his new invention the Theatre Opera Key. The Theatre Opera Key, unlike the Persiniscope, would project animated drawings onto any type of screen. The device would have a horizontal film strip that could be up to 50 meters long, and each strip would contain somewhere between 300 to 700 transparent pictures all hand-painted by Charles himself onto gelatin plates, which would then be coated with shellac and frame in a cardboard strip, which would then be attached with split pins. The film strip would also have sprocket holes attached to the pins, and with this, the film strip could be advanced with the help of two horizontal copper reels that could be cranked by hand. As the film would advance with the help of the pinch rollers, the images would pass through in front of a magic lantern, where it would project the image onto one of the 36 mirrors at the center of the turning wheel. The images would then be reflected to another mirror, which would then be reflected through a focusing lens towards a movable mirror. The moving mirror could be used to adjust the characters at any part within the background. The background itself would be stationary and projected through a second magic lantern from a glass slide. And much like the characters, the background would also be painted by Charles Reynard. Reynard could also manipulate the speed of the film and repeat certain movements with the help of the hand crank. This was done so that he could make the shells as long as he wanted, which was often the case when he did show off his invention to the general public. When the device was complete, Reynard would demonstrate the machine at the Paris World's Fair in 1889, the same World's Fair Thomas Edison visited on his European trip that we covered in the last episode. So it's pretty possible that Reynard was the other sort of inspiration for Edison's kinetoscope if he ever had a chance to view the device. Reynard had a picture show ready for the viewers of the fair to see, titled A Good Beard. In it, a wanderer enters a cabaret and orders himself a beer from the waitress. However, a kitchen boy comes over and drinks the beer when the wanderer isn't looking, thus making the wanderer leave the bar annoyed. Reynard would try to sell his projection to anyone interested between 1889 to 1892. But even with demonstrations and an enthusiastic review article from the same Lionel Chair magazine, Reynard had a tough time selling his device. So he later figured that instead of just selling it to one person, why not use his invention to host theatrical shows for a wide audience? So Charles would create two more shows for his projection, one titled The Clown and His Dogs in 1890, which involves a circus show with the clown's three dogs performing some tricks, and Papa Piro, or Poor Pete in English, created in 1891. With those three films in his hand, Charles Renard would present his Theatre Opera Key at a wax museum called Musée Grévan, located in Paris. There, he would sign a contract with the owner on October 8, 1892, where Renard would receive 500 francs per month, about $543.75, which would be about $17,976.02 in 2023, plus a 10% bonus for each box office result. Renard would also be responsible for maintaining his machine and the film strips, something which we'll cover more of later, and he would be required to direct each show. With the contract finalized and signed, Reynard would host his first pantomime Luminous animated show at the Cabinet Fantastique on October 28, 1892, presenting his three animated films, where composer Gaston Poulin would play the piano while the films were running. With the background of how the Theatre Opera came to be, let's take a look at the films from the device and see how they hold up today. Before we start the review, just some quick information about the films that we're going to cover. Out of the eight animated films that Reynard has made, only two of them are still with us to this day. We will get into the reason why that is real soon. But another fact is that the running time on these films are much shorter compared to how Reynard first presented his work. The frames from these films are still the same, but with the way Reynard would control the speed and motion of his machine, he could make his show somewhere between 10 to 15 minutes long. But obviously with better technology, we could speed the films up a little and reduce them down between 2 to 5 minutes. One more interesting fact, at least in terms of Papa Piro, is that this little animated film was the early step into having his own music, and also an early step of voice acting. Gaston Poulin, a famous composer at the time, would provide Reynard's films their own soundtrack and play them on the piano, and he even wrote a song for the character in the film, Piro, where he also provided the singing voice for the character, while two of other Reynard's assistants would also provide the voices for the characters on a couple of occasions. With the information out of the way, let's talk about the two films we still have from Emile. These two films include Papa Piro, as mentioned previously, and Around a Cabin, which was made and shown to the crowd two years later. 
So how do these films hold up? Well, coming from someone that's big into animation, I remember watching these two films at the time and thought they were impressive for 1890s standards, and they're still impressive to an extent. I've always wondered how Renard was able to create these films the way they were, and after reading up on how that was possible, I have grown to appreciate these films and the hard work Charles went into creating them. Now I will admit, when looking at these films again from a critical and modern point of view, these films have shown their age in terms of how the characters are animated. There are moments where the movements can't be stiff, and there are a couple of moments where it seems like they kind of merge themselves into the background too. But seeing how Reynard was able to create and tell a story based on his work helps overshadow the technical flaws these films have. Much like I can't imagine what the public reaction was when the Kinetoscope came out, I'm really wondering what the public reaction was when Emil made his drawings come to life. He practically showed the world how to project your creation to a live audience, and that's something to give him credit for. The stories of these two films are simple, though I do see people being confused on what the story is supposed to be about, as there is no dialogue to work off on, and because these are short films, there's only so much these two films can do to keep a person's interest before they move on to something else. So while some people might enjoy these films for what they are, I can see others shrugging off these films after viewing them only once. Personally, I enjoy these films for what they are and for what Emil was able to accomplish. If I did have to pick between the two films, I would go with Papa Piro more because it at least has a story going for it. While the other film is what would some consider the first beach animated film and that's all there is to it. Then, and the animation quality of Piro shines more than Around a Cabin. In terms of my personal rating, I will rate Papa Piro an 8 out of 10 and Around a Cabin a 5 out of 10. And in terms of the overall device, I would give it an 8 out of 10 myself. Would I recommend these two films? Honestly, if you're a film and an animation buff, you should definitely check out these two films and see where the idea of animated films came from and how it has evolved. I would say watch Papa Piro more than Around a Cabin, but still check out both films seeing that they are short to begin with. But that's just my opinion. How well do these films hold up to a general audience? Well, based on the reactions from the live streams as well as several review sites, it's clear that overall the films are still held in some high regard for movies and animation buffs alike. A couple of people were also impressed with what Reynard was able to accomplish with what he had available to him at the time, and considered these animated works a little high quality of that of the 1890s, though there were a couple that admitted the story can either be confusing or it's not all that special. But regardless, considering the people's feelings on these films, I say that the HR Optique deserves a definite own it. If you could find a way to get these films in some form of physical copy, you definitely won't be disappointed. And there's mine and the audience's review on Reynard's work. After Emile's first performance with the Theater Opera Key, the show became an immediate smash hit. Between the 1890s to March 1st, 1900, it's estimated that over 500,000 people would come and see Emile's animated works in action. This, of course, would cause Charles Reynard to create more animated works during this time period, and he would change up his shows as the years went on. While the Theater Opera Key was a huge success at the time, this would be the only time we will ever talk about Charles Reynard in this series as a whole. Reason being is that although the Theatro shows were a huge success for Reynard, the fact that he would only receive 10% for each show along with the 500 francs per month would later leave Reynard almost penniless up until his death. Not only that, but with the rise of the kinetoscopes and soon film projectors, Charles and Mia would barely be able to keep up with the growing rise of motion pictures. Not to mention Meyer's growing demand for Reynard to create more hand-painted films, would prove to be difficult and time-consuming compared to the time it would usually take to create and show a live motion picture. Charles did have plans to create a motion picture camera to use alongside his Theatre Opera Key, and he had it created and ready around late 1895. However, something also happened that year that would completely overshadow Renard's work. That event will be covered in a later episode. But regardless, even Charles would later decide against filming motion pictures, thinking that series of photographs created less of a fantasy than that of a cartoon. So Charles would continue creating more animated works until he was more or less forced to stop, and his last show ended at the Musée Grouvan on March 1st, 1900. While Charles would try to capture the same success that the Theatre Opera Key once brought him, like creating a double practice scope to create a three-dimensional moving image, it was clear that Emile would not make the same finance as the Theatre Opera Key once did. So before Emile would spend the rest of his last years in various nursing homes and hospitals, in a fit of depression and rage, Emile would take a hammer and smash his Theatre Opera Key to smithereens, damaging it beyond repair. Then, he would later throw all of his animated films and his machine into the Sign River below. 
However, as luck would have it, Charles' son, Paul Reynard, actually managed to protect and hide two of his father's films before he had a chance to throw them away. Those two films are the ones that we've just reviewed and they are still shown and preserved to this day. Although Charles would later die as a forgotten man on January 9th, 1918, over the years of his death, Emil Reynard would soon get the recognition he deserves. Around the 1930s, Paul Reynard would donate several of his father's surviving practice scopes and his two animated films that Paul managed to keep safe to the Cinematique Franchet, and in 1972, a man by the name of Pierre Bookman would reconstruct Charles' Theatre Opera Key using drawings of the machine from the 1892 issue of La Nature, where Julian Pepp would restore Pavel Pierrot in 1981, where the brand new Theatre Opera Key would be shown at the Musée Grouvan, where Emile showed off his original Theatre Opera Key almost 90 years ago at that time. Then in 1985, both films would soon be transferred into a 35mm film strip where they would be synchronized with Gaston Poulin's original score, and you can still see these films in all of their glory on YouTube. So while Charles might not have been a household name later in his life, his contribute to the film world with his shows should not be forgotten completely. And hopefully these films will still be shown to future film historians and animated buffs alike, as Charles's work was truly worth something that stood the test of time. That'll do it for today's episode of Film of the Year. This is Accorda Diesel saying thank you all so much for watching today's video. If you've enjoyed today's episode and have learned something, hit that like button. And if you'd like to be the first to see the next episode, hit that subscribe button and click the notification bell so you don't miss it. Also, don't forget to check out the two previous episodes of the series, where I talk about the prehistory and the kinetoscope, if you haven't seen them already to get more context. Also, if you love Let's Plays and walkthroughs, I have a gaming channel where I play mostly retro games if that's your type of content. I'll put the link in the description, as well as putting mine and Bonnie's co-op channel, Review Bros, where we review movie and TV shows together. So, until then, this has been Sakura Diesel saying thank you all so much for watching, and I'll catch you at the next episode of Film of the Year. Take care.